We're going to pick up in our text this morning from Revelation once again. And we're coming to the, the end of the, the seven bowl judgments, uh, the, the, the sixth and the seventh uh, bowls that are being poured out upon the earth. And this is it. This is, this is uh, the, the judgment of God upon earth is done, he says. And so join with me, if you will, uh, in Revelation chapter 12. And we're going to be reading, beginning there in, in or Revelation chapter 16, we're going to begin in, there in verse 12. The sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river, the Euphrates, and its water was dried up, so that the way would be prepared for the kings from the east. And I saw coming out of the mouth of the dragon, and out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet, three unclean spirits like frogs, for they are spirits of demons performing signs which go out to the kings of the whole world to gather them together for the war of the great day of God the Almighty. Behold, I am coming like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake and keeps his clothes so that he will not walk about naked and men will not see his shame. And they gathered them together to the place uh, which in Hebrew is called Harmageddon. Then the seventh angel poured out his bowl upon the air, and a loud voice came out of the temple from the throne saying, It is done. And there were flashes of lightning and sounds and peals of thunder, and there was a great earthquake such as there had not been since man came upon the earth, or came to be upon the earth. So great an earthquake was it, and so mighty. The great city was split into three parts, and the cities of the nation fell. Babylon the Great was remembered before God to give her the cup of the wine of his fierce wrath. And every island fled away, and the mountains were not found, and huge hailstones, about 100 pounds each, came down from heaven upon men, and men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, because the plague was extremely, because its plague was extremely severe. I'll tell you, walking through this series of uh, judgments that, that God is, is going to unfold in, in terms of His wrath in the last days, uh, it's sobering. It's an it's arduous journey to walk through. But it is a journey nonetheless that God has has placed there in, in His Word for us to, to navigate and, and to recognize that, you know, the, the good news is, is that God has already declared victory over our sin. I just want to emphasize that. When we, when we begin to look at these um, statements here about His judgment to come, this judgment is coming against those who have taken their stand against Him. They have rejected the gift of God's grace and mercy and salvation. They have rejected the Lord's Christ. And by the time, as, as we have been noting, I've been highlighting that every time we go through a particular section of, of text that mentions it, but over and over and over again, God is declaring His good news. He is giving them opportunity to repent, and they are refusing to do so. But here's the good news, and we'll see this at the end uh, from, as I prayed in, uh, from one of the Thessalonian letters that Paul is, is recognizing. Here's this church that they spent, he spent three weeks of his life there and had to leave because of persecution, but they had to stay. And it reminds me of what we see happening, unfolding in Afghanistan right now. That there are many people, some of our missionaries and, and other people that are, have been strategically placed there have have been evacuated, have made it out of there. But many of them, some of them, and even you know, the locals, they have chosen to stay. And to do so, they are facing great tribulation. As what we find, and, and again, that the severity of the persecution that Paul and his missionary team were facing in Thessalonica, and they were literally run out of the region, out of that town area, and, and down they went on down to Berea. But as, as we think about you know, what was unfolding in terms of those days, we, we see that the, the, those that were left behind, uh, the Thessalonians, they faced the reality of great tribulation. And Paul highlights the fact that they came, they believed the word, 
They believe the gospel in the midst of great tribulation. So there's hope. There's hope in, even in a situation that's unfolding right now in Afghanistan and as people are facing great tribulation, there's hope that God will awaken them by the Spirit to see the truth of the gospel and be saved. They may lose their life on this earth. They preserve their life in Christ for eternity. We need to pray to that end. And that's why, you know, we've grateful again, as I, as I was sharing earlier, um, I, we took just a couple days to go help uh, my son Josh and, and, and his wife Casey and, and see the grandkids as they're settling into their, their new place there in Richmond and they're making preparations. You now everything's developing in terms of planning a church there. They're taking part in that. Uh, but I'm, I'm right in the middle of a project and my phone goes off and I look and, uh, it's, it's a text from, uh, one of the mothers of our, um, you know, our, uh, one of our chaplains with North American Mission Board and then uh, a, a reference that, that he's going to get in touch with me. And then I'm getting a phone call from the Netherlands on my phone and able to talk to Trey. And then we only not spend, spend some time in, in conversation, but just praying over the realities of, of what God's wanting to do in providing for refugees, not only with basic items to, to care for them, uh, but also with the gospel. And I, I, I just highlight that because this is how God is working in this world. He is in the midst of, you know, pouring out His grace, even in the midst of great tribulation, as men and women are still taking their stand. This is from day one there in, in terms of the fall, Men and women have taken their stand against the one true God, but He is the Savior. He is the Shepherd. He is the God who has created us. And that He has given us not just temporary life. And we sang songs about, you know, the, the Father of, of the creation in which we, in which we live. We, we have all that we need to, to live and survive because God created that. And yet, He is, He's, He's done far beyond what this world could ever offer. This world's coming to an end. And we see the, the words of judgment that God is, is bringing. He, he, is, he is saying ahead of time. He is laying out ahead of time. What a, a great God we serve. He's not going to surprise us with this information. He's telling us ahead of time. What's going to surprise everybody is that they're not going to be looking or watchful for the fact that Jesus is coming again. He's going to come when people least expect it, like a thief in the night. And so we come to these events. And these are the final two bold judgments, number six and number seven, uh, as we conclude here in this series of 21 judgments, uh, bold, you know, the, the statements of wrath, the declaration of wrath that's going to be poured out and the breaking of seven seals, the sounding of seven trumpets, and now the pouring out, the immediate, as I described it. It's just like taking uh, this like small, uh, uh, and in terms of height, it's just, it's just a very shallow bowl, as it were, and just literally just dumping immediately, one right after the other. It wants us to have that idea that the uh, immediacy of judgment you know, other judgments have taken time, months, maybe years. This is just immediate, rapid fire unfolding. And as we think about this, I, I want you to think about it in the context because I, I, I talked about it, I prayed about it, um, you know, earlier that you know, we have two definitive statements in world history, profound statements of, of judgment that have happened on this, uh, that, that has happened, is going to happen on this earth. And they, they're followed by statements now, like what we'll see here today, it is done. And God is done with pouring out His wrath upon this earth. But wrath, His wrath and judgment continues for eternity for those who reject Him. And yet, because of another act of judgment that God uh, enacted upon this earth um, some 2,000 plus years ago when He sent His Son, uh, He died on the cross. His wrath, God's wrath poured out on Him our judgment upon Him. And at the moment when everything was complete, Jesus says, as, as everything was done according to the Father's plan, Jesus declares that statement, it is finished. John Phillips, he details that the two most crucial events in world history in, 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 in connection with these two statements, 
The, the Holy Land has been chosen by God as the stage upon which two crucial events take place. One on a mountain and one on a plain. Mount Calvary and the plain of Megiddo are the two altars of sacrifice that dominate the history of the world. On Mount Calvary, grace redeemed the world by the sacrifice of God's Son. On the plains of Megiddo, vengeance offers up the armies of the world in a sacrifice of doom. Both are bloodbaths. Both are the descent of wrath upon sin. Both are brought about by God's bitterest, bitterest foes who work out, despite themselves, God's perfect and sovereign will. Across both can be written the words of Peter, uh, the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel were gathered together for to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel determined before to be done, Acts 4, 27 and 28. From each proceeds a supper, one a feast of remembrance for the people of God. We know that is the Lord's table. And the other a feast of retribution for the carrion. At Mount Calvary, there rang up the gates of heaven, a victorious, victorious cry, it is finished. At the plain of Armageddon, there rings down to earth an answering cry. It is done. We've noted last week uh, that we walked through the first five of these bowls. Uh, we, we introduced the seven bowls of the wrath of God that begins in this chapter 16. And then we, we find the first four bowls that devastate the created order. The fifth bowl brings uh, darkens or, or or brings darkness the, the 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 beast throne so his over his domain which is worldwide and we come now this morning to the sixth and the seventh and the sixth bowl brings the world to battle God and the seventh bowl brings God's final judgment the sixth bowl brings the world to battle God. And again, I, I read this last week as a summary. I, I try to provide summaries as we're going through this to try to just formalize a thought and, and put that in your mind so you see how this breaks down. So we've been walking through a variety of different summaries from some very gifted theologians and Bible scholars and teachers, preachers. But Ben Dunson, he gives us one here uh, with regards to these seven bowl judgments. He writes in his this survey that in Revelation 16, we encounter a final sevenfold cycle, the seven bowls of the wrath of God. The seven bowls are clearly patterned after the seven trumpets. The four bowls uh, exactly match the realms of the created order in the first four trumpets, earth, oceans, fresh water, and sky. The fifth bowl like the fifth trumpet, centers on the anguish of those who do not trust in Jesus. The sixth bowl, matching the sixth trumpet, uh, begins at the river Euphrates and is also focused on the destructiveness of war. And then the seventh bowl uh, brings us to the final judgment. Now, careful readers, he notes, once they notice the way that the seven bowls are patterned after the seven trumpets, also will notice striking differences. The similarities and differences reveal equally important things to, to the reader. The main similarity that each judgment is in the same creational realm shows us that the triumphs or that, that, that the trumpets and seals convey the same basic truth. The world is a world under God's judgment and has been since the curse, the fall that led to the curse. And so this world has, has been under God's judgment. The main dissimilarity, however, is equally important. With the seven bowls, we have left the realm of partial and limited judgments from the Lord and have arrived at the final judgment. And that answers the, uh, the argument, the question that, that Peter always gets. Uh, we, we come, you know, he, he wrote about it in 2 Peter chapter 3. Where is the evidence of your coming? And the Lord has given it to us here in the Word. 
It's coming. Don't let God's patience throw you off. God's patience. And again, when you start thinking about these judgments, and we judgments, this is not new to world history. God judged the entire world with a flood, Peter says in 2 Peter chapter 3. Forget that. We have evidence still of that in terms of, of, you know, marked on our creation, the scars of the flood on creation. We have a reminder every time you see a rainbow in the sky, irregardless of how people want to take that and use it for other messages in life, the, the world, uh, sees that, um, that rainbow and, and God is making a declarative statement. He said he is remembering something that this promise that he made that he will no longer, he will never once again to destroy the earth by flood. But this doesn't promise that he's not going to destroy the earth. He's going to do that by fire, he says. And so we have here um, the unfolding of the sixth and the seventh uh, sea or the sixth and seventh bowl. And the, the, the sixth bowl, it says there in verse 12, that the sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river, the Euphrates. And again, this is going to be more judgment. It's going to impact the world. Uh, it's going to impact movement and these kinds of things. And again, some people might ask, and I was, I was stating that, you know, these people are saying, well, where's the promise that he's coming and these kinds of things. Uh, the world has just marched on like it always has, but it hasn't. There was a judgment of the flood. But then we see in Exodus, uh, you know, the reality of the judgment uh, that unfolds uh, with regards to Egypt. And God is specific. He's specific and strategic in terms of that judgment. We even noted that uh, last week that that when God uh, turned the, the water, to, the fresh water to blood in, in the Egyptian uh, judgments, uh, the plagues, that you know when you would go and find a stone basin that had your water in it that you would use to drink out of you know there at your house uh, that you would uh, go there and there's blood in it that he he took all the fresh water you didn't he didn't it's not that they went out and collected it and came back and there was blood in it because you got it from the river Nile maybe and it was full it was blood now no he he makes all the fresh water in that region blood like blood that's the plague. That's what we were talking about last week. Well, he's going to do that worldwide. You know, he, he's strategic in the past and specific in area, but in the end, it's worldwide. There's no place to get relief. No place to go and hide. And so you think, well, what kind of God is it? When you talk about God as a God of love, what kind of God well, you know, you, you, you take a look at it. God could have wiped out Egypt in one plague. He could have taken them all out, period. But what does He do? Plague after plague after plague. They, he gives them the opportunity to turn. To turn to Him. And to do what He is commanding them to do. And so that's, you know, a God of justice, but a God of grace. And so when we see... There, even in terms of the, you think, wow, 21 judgments of wrath being poured out on the earth and just devastating the entire world. But time after time is opportunity for people to turn in repentance. God is patient, not wishing any to perish, but to turn to Him. Now, I'll tell you what. You know, it's, it's, hip, it's hypocritical for anybody to say that I just, I just, I just think it's terrible that God is, is throwing out his judgment or his wrath. You know, he's pouring out on this, just, you know, this tribulation upon our lives. It's just terrible. And yet, if, if you see an injustice in this world that you believe in, you believe in justice, right? There are countless causes in our world. Uh, uh, the, on any given day, any given moment, people are standing up and they'll protest for it or they'll lay down their life for it. You know, they believe in causes in terms of this earth and you, you want justice. Well, that's, that's all God is, is giving. You want justice. That's what God, the God of the Bible is, is a God of justice. He is true and he is righteous. And so we see this sixth angel and he poured out his bowl on the great river, Euphrates. 
And as a result of that, the water of the Euphrates dried up. Well, you know, that, that water would have been blood saturated anyways. So now it's dried up. And Phillips, John Phillips, he notes here that the Euphrates River is indeed a great river. It is 1,800 miles long, and in places it is 3,600 feet wide and 30 feet deep. In ancient times, it was a formidable barrier to an invading force from the east. And for centuries, it has been the dividing line between the east and the west. But the time has come for those tremendous hordes of the east to assert themselves, to mobilize, and to hurl themselves westward. So far, they have been held back by an impassable barrier. But that barrier, the Euphrates, it is now removed. The nightmare that has haunted world leaders for generations becomes a reality. The way of the kings of the east is prepared. And that's what we find here. With the drying up the Euphrates River, we find there in verse 12, that the way would be prepared for the kings from the east. Or in, in the actual Greek text there, it, it means um, the rising from the rising of the sun. Well, the rising of the sun is from the east. And it's from that territory. And again, you know, it, it's, it's in terms of strategic location based on, you know, a particular starting GPS point, And that is Israel, the land of promise. Jerusalem. And so east of that, certainly, uh, they, you know, Jerusalem's in the Middle East and then you have the Far East. And so the Lord is providing access, uh, for these Oriental leaders who will come to the land of Palestine. Now there's a lot of speculation and you look at commentaries, uh, about this and they're coming and why they're coming there. There is some thought that because there's so much chaos in the world and, you know, again, you can just imagine, you know, we, we have, uh, you know, world nations coming together. They're sending peoples together and they're having conferences or confabs about how to take care of, for instance, global warming. Those kinds of things. They, they look at the, what's happening in the world and they think that as, as, as just, you know, um, the events unfolding, like they gather together and, and they try to figure out what they can do and they might make types of treaties or statements or whatever. Uh, to collectively work together and, and get something done. Well, you can imagine that by this time in history with so much going on in the world, that there, there are definitely kings coming together trying to figure out what to do. And these are the kinds of kings that are not looking to God for answers. And so they're going to gather together. And, and there are some that, that are the mindset that, you know, that this, uh, the kings of the East, even though they're, they're a part of the one world government and under the reign of the Antichrist, that they, they may not like what's unfolding in these days. And so now they're marching towards Babylon, as it were, uh, towards the Antichrist to either, um, assist in the efforts or, um, or take, you know, try to take him out. But we know that there's a, there's a specific reason why these kings are coming. The Lord makes it very clear. That he is drawing all these nations together as they, they stand against him. There, it's, it's what the Bible, uh, refers to in, in the, the Hebrew as it's described, Har Megiddon. It's, it's, Megiddon is the Valley of Megiddo. And that's, that's where this war is going to supposedly take place in terms of war, I say supposedly, because the, the, the world can gather together with every available uh, resource and artillery, uh, resource in their possession, and they, they stand no chance whatsoever with a holy and just and righteous God, the Creator. And so that's why they're coming. They may have, I don't know, I don't know what their intentions are gonna be. I don't know if, if they see this as an opportunity to, to try to either bring reinforcements for the Antichrist or to put pressure on the Antichrist. Whatever their motives are, God is using this purpose. This is a strategic, uh, literally a supernatural intervention of a natural, of the natural order to make this possible. And He's luring, bringing them in just where He wants them to be. 
the kings of the world. Therefore, we see in, in verse 13 and 14 that the kings of the world are gathered together for war and, and they're going to gather together. We, we recognize that for whatever reason uh, we could possibly think of that they would be gathering together. The Lord tells us that this is how they're going to be gathered together is because of deluding demonic spirits. There are three unclean spirits we see here uh, in verse 13 that I saw coming out of the mouth. And again, this is a part of the sixth bowl judgment unfolding here. The drying up the Euphrates River, making the passageway for the kings of the east to come. And then he says, And I saw coming out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet. I've seen many who refer to this as, and rightfully so, as um, the unholy trinity. Satan. The beast, that is the Antichrist and his false prophet, and their unclean spirits protruding forth from their mouths. Three unclean spirit, spirits like frogs. Now frogs, you know, you go back, you know, well, that was one of the plagues, plagues of frogs back in Egypt. They're not welcome. It's not good for your land. And they're slimy and disgusting in terms of, I mean, one frog, you know, in the hand of uh, a little boy coming up to uh, another little boy or a group of girls and handing that, trying to hand that off doesn't, some, sometimes that doesn't work out so well. Um, you know, there are some kids that are like, yeah, I love frogs. You know, they, they'll go after them. Others, ooh, they're just slippery, slimy. And so, but again, the plague of frogs, unwelcome. And to have unclean spirits like frogs. That's how he's describing them. That's how he's in, 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 in his description, what he's seen. He's trying to give a description. And again, uh, not only in terms of, of that, but it, it, it takes us back to a plague in world history that was originated by God himself. And they come out of the mouth of the dragon and the antichrist and the false prophets. And then he goes on to say in verse 14 that, that these Frogs, these unclean spirits like frogs, they are spirits of demons. So I, I've made this statement before, and just a clarification, that you know this world is teeming with demonic forces of Satan. You know, he is the prince of the power of the air, and and his demonic forces, they're they're not omnipotent, they're, they're not all powerful, they're not all knowing or whatever. In, in terms of how we understand God, there is no yin to God's yang or how people want to say there's equal forces. No such thing. But these are supernaturally empowered beings, demonic forces, fallen angels. And Satan is utilizing them throughout the world. And we see it. We saw Jesus dealt with it over and over again. He was casting out demonic uh, beings, uh, spirits that were in individuals they knew him when he arrived on this scene they pleaded with jesus when he arrived on the scene not to cast them to put them in the pits ahead of their time they know that there's a time coming as so i bring this up because you know and you know false teachers false prophets false preachers false Gospels, all, all of this is derivative of demonic forces and activities. And so, you know, we may not see the, the realities that if somebody says, hey, I saw a ghost and they believe in ghosts and, and these kinds of things, and, and they, they may have, they may have seen something demonically. However, these fallen, unholy, angel beings are moving and working, but they are going to be used here, it says here, um, as, as deluding influences. They're going, to, they're going to be dispatched to the kings of the nations and convince them that they need to gather together in this one massive force. Now, we've already seen this in terms of the Antichrist when we were looking at the introduction of the Antichrist that we also know John tells us that the spirit of Antichrist is in the world now and that there is a physical man coming one day that is the Antichrist of Satan. 
That's coming. But the spirit is in the world. Because demonic forces, demonic evil is in this world. Fallen angels are in the midst of this world. But Paul, he, he, he talks, talking to the, the, the Thessalonians in 2 Thessalonians 2, he, he speaks about, certainly with, with regard to the arrival of the Antichrist and things are going to be happening in times, he says there in verse 11 of 2 Thessalonians 2, for this reason, God, listen to that, God will send upon them a deluding influence so that they will believe what is false. That's what's happening here. God is sending this deluding influence. It's coming out of the mouths of Satan, the Antichrist, the false prophets. In other words, they're coming out of the words, speaking and deluding, and these people are going to believe what is false. And what is false is, hey, we need to gather together and take a stand against God. We can do it. I remember when when my brother and I went out for football for the first time, when, when we were not allowed to play peewee football uh, in Vienna Rec League because mom would be driving up and down, out, you know, or walking uh, in, on Grand Central Avenue in front of Neal Elementary where they had practices out there when we were kids. And those, those little guys had their helmets on and they were, you know, they were doing these exercises where their he- helmet was on and their head was to the ground and they were like doing stuff with their bodies and all this kind of stuff. And mom's like, you're going to ruin your necks. And, you know, she just would not let us go. She, she didn't want us to get injured, all these kinds of things. But finally she let us, she let us go uh, when we got to junior high school, go out for the seventh grade football team. We we're like, yes, seventh and eighth grade. And that was awesome, and we were loving practice, and we were enjoying what we were learning and all this kind of stuff. And and I, I couldn't believe it, but the coach, he put me in with some of the other running backs. I was going to be able to run the ball. I couldn't believe it. I was so excited. And then we scrimmaged the ninth grade football team. And, man, we were like seventh and eighth graders. We're like, we're going to get up. We're going to take them out. You know, we're all, like, pumped up. And they annihilated us. They destroyed us. I was injured when I left the field. I, I, I had the entire ninth grade freshman class. I felt like I had the entire freshman class pile drive me to the ground uh, when I got the ball for the first time. I could not breathe. My mask, it was muddy. My mask was stuck into the ground. They had to pull me off the ground because I was stuck into the mask. I, I, I lost, you know, that like, We've got him, you know. That's, that's, they're going to be deluded and to think that they're going to be able to take a stand against God. They won't be able to. No way. Now, you know, like, you try to imagine how does this, how does this happen? How does God make this happen? Well, first Kings chapter 22, uh, we find Ahab. He's got 400 prophets. And he's, he's seeking, you know, the Lord's favor in terms of battle and winning battle and all this kind of stuff. And, uh, and he's, he's wanting to, to have a favorable prophetic word concerning victory. And the 400 prophets are giving it to him. They're telling him exactly what he wants to hear. And they believe it. That, that he's going to be victorious. Well, Micaiah, he comes on the scene and, and, 1 Kings chapter 22, and verse 19, he says, Therefore hear the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne, and all the host of heaven standing by him on his right hand and on his left. The Lord said, Who will entice Ahab to go up and fall at Ramoth Gilead? In other words, who will delude him into believing that he's going to win? But he's actually, he's, he's announcing his fall. And one said this while another said that, then a spirit, 21, then a spirit came forward and stood before the Lord and said, I will entice him. Now, this is a fallen angel. This is a fallen spirit. Angel is what this spirit is, is representing an angel. And the Lord said to him, how? And he said, I will go out and be a deceiving spirit in the mouth of all his prophets Then he said, you are to entice him and also prevail. Go and do so. That's what he's doing in the last days with these frog-like demon 
spirits, as it were, deluding the mouth coming from, words coming from, the, the mouth of, of the kings of the nations saying, people, we've got to go together and do this. Now, I love, we don't have to go here, but I, I just love because he, you know, Micaiah gets, he gets nailed for this. I mean, you know, they, they don't like what he's saying here. And so, uh, in verse, um, 23. Now, therefore, behold, the Lord has put a deceiving spirit in the mouth of all the, your prophets, and the Lord has proclaimed disaster against you. In other words, he's just putting it right up front there. All your prophets, all 400 of them, they're lying. They're, there's a deceptive, deluding spirit. They're lying to you. Well, then, verse 24, here it is. Then uh, Zedekiah, the son of Chenanah, came near and struck Micaiah on the cheek. I mean, he slapped him poof, and said, how did the spirit of the Lord pass from me to speak to you? In other words, how did you get the Lord, the real spirit, and I didn't? Micaiah said, behold, you shall see on that day when you enter an inner room to hide yourself. Then the king of Israel said, take Micaiah and return him to Amon, the governor of the city. And to jo Joash, the king's son, and said, and say, thus says the king, put this man in prison and feed him sparingly with bread and water until I return safely. And so Micaiah looks at the king and said, if you indeed return safely, the Lord has not spoken by me. And he said, listen, all you people, one man, faithful man, prophet of God, speaking against 400 prophets in this king. And you can just imagine that, you know, he did not return safely from this adventure. He was speaking the word of the Lord, but these 400 prophets were deceived by a, de a demon, a fallen angel. This is how this works. It's like, wow, God is sovereign. Demonic forces have no power against him, but he will use it. We, we see there in, in terms of Satan and, and his dealings with Job. So we see here. And it says here that these demon, demonic, unclean spirits, like three you know, frogs, spirits like frogs, they're performing signs, miracles. And they are to go out to the whole world, the kings of the world, so they're going out everywhere, and they are to gather them together for the war of the great day of God the Almighty. So they're going to be going out and using deceiving words, deceiving signs, miracles, and people are going to believe. And it's, it's not like on our day now, brothers and sisters, where that there are people out claiming that they, they, they have miraculous signs and what they have the power of miraculous signs and wonders. And they're performing these and, and they're deceiving people, believing that they have these kinds of gifts and abilities to heal people. And all it is is in many ways, it's, it's a sleight of hand and showmanship and, and all these kinds of things for, for greed and gain and, and those things. But yet, we recognize the reality of demonic forces in this world. That there could be some legitimate looking like miracles that are performed, but they are the result of this demonic power and influence. God intends to gather the nations. He said it a long time ago through Joel. Joel chapter 3 verse 2 He says, I will gather all the nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat then I will enter into judgment with them on behalf there on behalf of my people and my inheritance, Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations and they have divided up my land. And he goes on to say that God will sit to judge upon all the surrounding nations in verse nine of Joel three, proclaim this among the nations, prepare a war, rouse the mighty men. 
Let all the soldiers draw near. Let them come up. And the way he's going to make that happen is he's going to send these deluding, these deluding spirits. Beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. Let the weak say, I am a mighty man. Hasten and come, all you surrounding nations, and gather yourselves there. Bring down, O Lord, your mighty ones. Let the nations be aroused and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat. For there I will sit to judge all the surrounding nations. Put in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Come tread, for the wine press is full. The vats overflow, for their wickedness is great. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. For the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. When we talked about this earlier, about the you know bringing in the harvest and the sickle, you know, those realities, we're, we're talking about just utter judgment, just utter, utter destruction, devastation, loss of the armies of the kings of the nations. Now, as we've noted in the seven um, breaking of the, the seven seals and, and the sounding of the seven trumpets, there's, a, there's always been an interlude somewhere in the midst of that. Um, that that interlude for here in, in the bowl six comes at this point in verse 15. It's in, it's in parentheses. And that's how it's written in the Scriptures. That's how it's written in the original language. Behold, I am coming like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake and keeps his clothes so that he will not walk about naked and men will not see his shame. Who's the one coming like a, sheep, uh, like a, a thief? Jesus. That's who that is. That's what we find. Behold, I am coming like a thief. Jesus said in Matthew 24, nonetheless, therefore, be on the alert, for you do not know which day your Lord is coming. But be sure of this, that if the head of the house had known at what time of the night the thief was coming, he would have been on the alert and would have not allowed his house to be broken into. For this reason, you, you also must be ready. For the Son of Man is coming in an hour when you do not think He will. And we see that uh, in terms of the Thessalonian letter. Paul is saying there in First Thessalonians 5, verse 1, Now as to the times and epics, brethren, you have no need of anything to be written to you, for you yourselves know full well that the day of the Lord will come just like a thief in the night. While they were saying peace and safety, then destruction will come upon them suddenly like labor pains upon a woman with, with child and they will not escape. So that's what the Lord is revealing here. And when, when he says, when Paul's writing, you, you know, you have no need of anything to be written to you. I mean, you, we talked about this. I've told you about this. Jesus has told us about this. We have lots of ways that we know and understand this. And so we find here that you know Jesus is coming like the thief. He is the one that is coming, and that's it's what they're recognizing. And so, who are the ones who are blessed? This is a beatitude here. Blessed is dot 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 dot. This is a blessing. Blessed is the one who stays awake and keeps his clothes, so that he will not walk about naked, and men will not see his shame. Well, the only way that God took care of the first naked couple after they sinned is what? He clothed them. They tried fig leaves. He used animal skins. When Christ came and died on the cross, He has clothed every one of His people with the righteousness of Christ. That's the clothes He's talking about. He's talking about being saved so in the in in this interlude he is describing that there is a way even in the midst of the this these final it is done judgments up until it is done this is the opportunity people have the opportunity to clothe themselves in the righteousness of the son of god to turn to him to not have their shame exposed. The shame is, is the shame of sin. And that, that nakedness is before God. He is a holy God and He knows our, our sin. So blessed is the one who stays awake. That word for 
wake in the original Greek is as uh, I am awake in the night. I am watchful on the alert. And how can we be alert, brothers and sisters, to these realities? Well, by knowing the Word of God. And we can warn other people through the Gospel, through these words. These are not easy words, but this is the Gospel nonetheless. And it is the Word of God that He's given us. And we need to be vigilant to keep this Word and to share it with others. And it's just, again, this respite in, in the midst of revealing the devastation of the judgment that's coming, this is a blessing of the Lord upon His people, the church. Blessed are you, church, because you are alert and are awaiting and looking forward to, you're looking for the coming. The Bible tells us to do that. And so we're looking, and we're not just waiting on top of the hillside and we've sold everything and we're waiting, knowing. We don't know the time. So what should we be about doing? Well, we should be doing the same thing that Jesus told His disciples on the Mount of Ascension when He said um, of the times and epics, you don't know. God knows that. You don't need to worry about that. But this is what you will do. You will be My witnesses. Beginning in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the uttermost parts of the world. But that's what we should be about doing, brothers and sisters, is being witnesses, sharing the hope of Christ, sharing the truth of Christ, His Word. And so, you know, as, as those who belong to Christ, um, he, he tells, uh, Paul tells the Thessalonians in 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 4, but, but you, brethren, are not in darkness that the day will, would overtake you like a thief. In other words, you know, we're, we're not going to be part of that day. It's not going to overtake us because we, we, we're going to be with the Lord. For you're all sons of light and sons of day. We are not of night nor of darkness. So then let us not sleep as others do, but let us be alert and sober. In other words, let us be sober in His Spirit. Let us be alert by His Word and keeping that. And then John would say in his first epistle in 1 John 2, 28, Now little children abide in Him so that when He appears, we may have confidence and not shrink away from Him in shame at His coming. Why? Because we belong to Him. <laughs> He's coming for us. If you know that He is righteous, you know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of Him. And so men and women, who have never come to the cross to have their sins judged. And they would be judged in Christ because He was judged for our sins. They will be judged for their own sins in the devastating judgment that is to come. And the place where this battle is going to happen is Armageddon. It's the Hebrew version of it. But it means Mount Megiddo looking down into the valley. Here it is, the Valley of Megiddo. And, you know, in, in terms of this, they're going to be gathered in, in for this massive battle. And the battle uh, will be almost over as soon as it begins. The Lord will take them out. And we come to the seventh seal. We'll be looking more details at Armageddon coming up in the weeks ahead. But the seventh angel, he pours out his bowl upon the air. And what, th what that literally means is upon the atmosphere, upon the heaven, you know, the, the heavenly realm and the heavens in terms of our atmosphere, we have lightning and thunder, all of these natural things that are unfolding as a result of what the Lord is doing. But I also want you to recognize that this judgment is, is going to be poured out on the air where, as, as we see in Ephesians chapter 2, that those who were dead in their trespasses and sins in which you were formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air. In other words, he his domain is this world. So this judgment is being poured out on this earth, but it's also it's it's going to be coming. We're going to we're gonna see lightning and thunder. We're going to have earthquake. We're going to have huge hundred pound, uh, hundred and thirty pound size hailstones coming through all of this. So the Lord is pouring it out in terms of the atmosphere, as it were, 
and judgment from natural the natural order, he's supernaturally intervening and bringing this about. And then he says there in verse 17 that in a loud voice came out of the temple from the throne. I, I would say that this loud voice is the Lord himself because he says it is done. It means it has become, it has come into being. It's in, it's in the perfect tense in terms of the Greek language means it's, it's continuous. It has been and will remain done ongoing from this time forevermore. And that's again, that's, that's what we see in terms of Christ when he declared in John chapter 19 that it is finished. He completed the work. John 1930. Therefore, when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said it is finished. And he had noted the knowing in verse 20, Eight, knowing that all things had already been accomplished to fulfill the Scripture. He says one thing, I'm thirsty. And then he says it is finished and he gives up his life. So God's final outpouring of wrath involves also the lightning and thunder. We see there lightning and thunder uh, rumbles. We see in in. Revelation 4, 5, they are issuing from God's throne. Uh, We see lightning and thunder and earthquake after the seventh seal. We see lightning and thunder and earthquake after the seventh trumpet. And now we have lightning and thunder and earthquake after the seventh bowl. And God's final outpouring of wrath involves a great earthquake. And, and it, it's great is, is, is mean mega, you know, mega is where we get our word megos. Um, from the Greek, mega, uh, it's, it's, it's very, uh, huge, uh, megala, uh, is like, you know, no, there's no more mega, megos than megala. And so what he's saying that there has not been an earthquake like this since man came to be upon the earth. Haggai. He says in, 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 in chapter two, verse six, for thus says the Lord of hosts, once more in a little while. And for God, if a, if a thousand years is like a day, then, you know, it's just a little while for him. I am I am going to shake the heavens and the earth and the sea also and the dry land. It's an earthquake unprecedented. And Isaiah says much of the same thing in Isaiah 24, 17, terror and pit and snare confront you, O inhabitant of the earth. Then it will be that he who flees the report of disaster will fall into the pit. In other words, there's everywhere you're running, the earth is just unfolding in front of you, and big pits are opening up, and you're just dropping in. And it says the earth is broken asunder, for window aboves are opened, in verse 18, and the foundation of the earth shake. There's earthquake, the earth is broken, the earth is split through, the earth is shaken violently, the earth reels to and fro like a drunkard, and it's tottering like a a shack, for its transgression is heavy upon it, and it will fall never to rise again. And then it says that the great city was split into three parts, and the great city here is a reference to Jerusalem. And from from it... um, you know, there'll be waters coming forth from the great city. And, you know, it, it's going to happen when we see the arrival of the Lord uh, and he'll be standing there at Zechariah chapter 14, verse four. Uh, in that day, his feet, that is the Lord, that is Christ, will stand on the Mount of Olives, which is in front of Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives will split in its middle from east to west by a very large valley so that half of the mountain will move forward the north and the other half towards the south. You will flee but the, by the valley of my mountains, for the valley of the mountains will reach to Azel. Yes, you will flee just as you fled before the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. Then the Lord my God will come and all the holy ones with him. And he'll stand. Take his stand. It says Babylon the great was remembered before God to give her the cup of the the wine of his fierce wrath. In other words, just as he promised, utterly. And Babylon is representing the domain of the Antichrist worldwide. It's over. Now, remember, it says here, um, 
you know, she, the, she was remembered before God. Um, and then every island fled away and the mountains were, were not found. In other words, like God just picked up the earth and he went like a rug, just flipped it out there. And it just came down just nice and smooth. Everything was different in, 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 in terms of, of the earth. And, and who can do that? Who, who can take creation and shake it like that? God can. And then God's final outpouring of wrath involves huge hailstones, about 100 pounds each. And again, the, the word there for the, the weight is, a, is about, um, you know, it's, 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 and a, it's a large, massive weight of, of precious metal. Um, and so it's one of the largest uh, amounts that they, they had in terms of their description of amounts. And so he's describing uh, these, these 100 pounds. Can you imagine? You know, you've been out in hailstones before, and I mean, you can see, you know, you know, softball size hailstones coming down and just breaking through glass uh, and, and damaging homes and these kinds of things. Imagine uh, hailstones of, of 100 pounds each or more. And they come down from heaven upon men. And instead of repenting, instead of turning to the Lord, men blaspheme God because of the plague of the hail. Because it was a, its plague was extremely severe. <sighs> we, we come to the conclusion of the final bowl judgment of all the 21 judgments that we have seen. And they are heavy. They're heavy with regards to the judgment of God being poured out upon the inhabitants of the earth who have taken their stand against the one true God and have utterly and completely rejected His Christ. These judgments depicted in the breaking of the seven seals, the sounding of the seven trumpets, and the pouring out of the seven bowls are representative of the wrath of the most holy, righteous, and true God who rightly reigns over the kings and nations of the earth. The successive unfolding of these 21 judgments in total reveal the patience of God, as we have talked about. And although they reveal His perfect justice, they reveal to us and the world His amazing grace. Because over and over again, he keeps sharing the good news. So this morning, we should recognize that the Lord is patient toward you, toward me, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. Any naysayers out there, bring that to bear from 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. For those who turn to God, from idols to serve the living God, we look forward to the promise given to the church at Thessalonica in 1 Thessalonians 1, verse 8, for the word of the Lord has sounded forth from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith toward God has gone forth so that we have no need to say anything. For they themselves report about report about us what kind of reception we had with you and how you turned to God from idols to serve a living and true God. And that's what men and women are going to have to do at the end times. They will have to turn away from the false God of the Antichrist and the image that they created of Him out of stone and turn to the true and living God. And here's the good news, brothers and sisters. And to wait for His Son from heaven, whom He raised from the dead, that is Jesus who rescues us from the wrath to come. Amen. Father, thank You for Your Word. And thank You that even in the midst of the realities of Your just and righteous judgment, that You share us with us in, in, in truth these words here this morning and have for, for centuries now this message is going out forth to nations and to kings. And we just pray, Lord, that in the name of Jesus Christ, that we would see uh, the fruit of this message and the fruit of sharing this, this text and these words to other people as we go from this place. That we would see people turn from false gods to the one true living God. Through your Son, Jesus Christ. In the name of Christ, I pray. Amen.